Hey, good morning. It's great to see you guys. Do you all have a good Thanksgiving? Awesome, man. Awesome. We, uh, I want to uh, just spend the first couple of minutes just thanking our team. We had a, uh, our family uh, got to get away and we got to go and hang with our family, which was awesome. And our family this year decided to meet in Nashville, Tennessee, because that's where my, where my brother is. And he's moving from there to Kentucky. And, well, if you've ever been to Nashville to Kentucky, you understand. You know, you got to meet there and get, like, one more time in Nashville. And so that's what we did. And we had a great time. And so last Sunday, about this time, we were getting ready for church. We are going to go to church with my brother. It's going to be awesome. And he asked me, just conversationally, uh, which is always fun because he's a law enforcement officer and I'm a pastor and the conversations are, they're just fun. But he says, hey man, are, are you nervous about being gone? Like, I mean, you're not there. So it was like the control freak and you nervous. And I said, no. I said, I'm not nervous. I was like, you know, I've been, I, we have Facebook Live and I can check in, but I said, I'm not nervous uh, because of the team that God's put here. I was like, man, our whole team, you guys are... When I tell you that this place is special, it's special because we worship God and it's because he's the focal point. But he has assembled such a team that points everybody back to him. I, you just need to know the group of people that, you, that, that are around you. World class good. World class good. Whether it was Kinner carrying around a rock, I thought, my goodness, is he ever going to set that thing down? <laughs> but the beauty is he showed us how to set our stuff down at the foot of the cross and let Jesus do a work in us. And Tammy last week talking about David's mighty men. Oh, that we would have friends like that in our lives. If we could say, yeah, yeah, I got a pal, man. I got a pal who jumped in a pit with a leopard on, or a lion on a, on a snowy day. That's pretty cool, man. Or a friend that, you know, when everybody else is retreating, like this guy said, no, I'm going to stay. And he fought. Oh, man, that we would have people in our lives like that that would be with us in that way. I bet we do. I bet we do. I just hope they're the kind of friends that are helping you become everything that Christ saved you for. So to answer that question, I was like, no, man. Whether it's our children's ministry, student ministries, our congregational care, our, our tech team. I mean, God, his, I, just, I thank God all the time for them. I thank God all the time for you. That being said, we had to go to church that morning. It was great. So the conversation ended and off we went to church. And it was so fun to actually just get to go to church and not have to be a part of the ceremony. Because let me tell you, life's a little bit different. Like when you have a responsibility, you get here early. We got there a little bit late. It was awesome. And then, then we did what church people do, or at least you should have if you haven't done it. We went and, got, we went and grabbed coffee. I was like, oh, this is awesome. And then on top of that, we sat in the very back row. We're like, we're not going to the front and we're not going to the middle. We're going in the back. And it was awesome. And it was so fun to watch everybody file in as, as we were worshiping. And then the pastor gets up and, man, we were, at a, we were a congregation called Midtown and a lot of neat, exciting things God's doing there and how he's leading. It's just so fun to see how big God is because the same God that we worship there, same God they worship there is just so cool. And uh, so what we had is we had, like, my youngest, who's seven, and we had my oldest. It was just fun to be at church as a family. But if you've ever been to church with somebody who's like a little person, you're worried about what somebody like this person's going to say. And so what do you do? You've got to make sure that they're entertained because we don't know if this guy's going to be entertaining enough to keep them sitting still. So what do you do? You give them an iPhone. That's what we did. We gave Gabriel an iPhone. And the pastor's up there preaching about grace, and he's preaching about God's love for us. I was like, man, this is spot on. This is awesome. So glad we get to take this in. And in the middle of just, just beauty, all of a sudden you start to hear, womp, womp, womp. If you've ever seen a movie where a submarine was diving and that alarm was going off, it was going off on Shaney's cell phone. Gabe had pushed a button, and in the middle of grace and mercy, you hear, womp, womp. It was like a warning to all sinners. If you don't get on this train, it's over. <laughs> and so we did what only, like, you know, parents would do. Only, the only rational thing that we could do is what adults do. If something is diving, you either go along or be left behind. So we dove, too, on top of our seven-year-old. And I grabbed the phone. 
And I grabbed the phone, and he got about four wah, wah, wah out, and uh, that stopped. And, man, I just hit a button. It turned off. And I quickly, because it wasn't a big deal, I was like, it's okay. I quickly put my, tried to put my arm around him to let him know it was all right. But every time I tried to get close to him, he started doing this. Every time I, I'd be like, come here, buddy. He's like, no. He's like, come here, buddy, come here. No. He was embarrassed. He was hurt. Not like physically, just in here. And he was mad. He's like, wow, that, that wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And the reason I'm telling you that story is, is this whole thing's unfolding. Just the Holy Spirit begins to whisper into my life. He's like, Mike, this is a reflection of my relationship with so many people. He's like, Mike, don't miss this. And here's what I want to tell you. This is why I'm telling this. I bet that there's at least one person in here this morning that maybe you're mad at God because he didn't answer your prayers the way you thought he should. And he's keeping trying through his son Jesus. He's trying to put his arm around you and say, I love you, but you keep doing this. Like, no, because you're, you're mad. Or maybe this morning, maybe somebody's embarrassed. You're like, hey, man, if you knew my life, like, there's no way God could love me. I'm just here. I'm going to go through the motions, but then I'm going to just, I'm out of here. And you're embarrassed. And Jesus keeps trying to put his arm around you, but you keep doing this. Maybe, maybe you're hurt. Somebody let you down. Somebody at church let you down. And I wanted to tell you that story to tell you this. In the midst of my son going like this, I stopped and I'm going to tell him something. I'm going to tell you what I told him. I said, son, your dad's love for you is way better than anything you're holding on to over here. And if you're hurt this morning, you keep doing this. If you're mad or you're angry, I want to tell you this. God's love for you is better than anything you could possibly holding, be holding onto this morning. And rather than pulling away, I would encourage you to lean into. Because man, when you lean into, his love changes everything like that. And that can be your new reality this morning. And I hope that it would be. But if that's not your story, if you're like, hey man, life for me is good, then this part is for you. That was just one piece of my day, and I saw God at work in it. God is constantly speaking to us, sharing his truth with us, sharing his love for us with the different experiences that we have throughout the day. My encouragement to you is to look for it. Look for him in the ordinary. Look for him, and you will see the divine, because he's constantly speaking to us. You're like, what does that have to do with David? I was just setting the table. So here we go. We're in this series called da that we're doing on David, and uh, we're going to be wrapping up around Christmas. And up to this point in our series on David, everything has been about David before he became king. You know, like he was a shepherd. He was out in a pasture, and out of all the people in Israel, God looked down, and he saw this guy's heart. He saw his relationship with David, and he goes, you're going to be the kind of shepherd. You're going to be the kind of leader that will lead my people to worship and glorify me. Man, we were with David. We read about David when he was with when he was out fighting Goliath, when he was out taking the giants down. And man, we look at some of these circumstances and we think, wow, these are overwhelming. And part of the truth is part of them were, over, were overwhelming for David, but rather than be overwhelmed, what happened was, is he chose to trust God more. So he's taken down giants. He's running in the wilderness. His circumstances aren't perfect, but his God is. His situation isn't ideal, but his God is, is better than any God on the planet, any God ever known. And so his faith, his trust is growing in God. And God is using all of these circumstances to prepare David for his future plans. And I want us to get this right here. The lessons that you've been taught, the lessons that you've learned in your past, God is going to use in his future plans for your life. Like everything, the good stuff, the bad stuff, the hard stuff, all these lessons that you've accumulated through life experience, God is going to use in his future plans for your life. He's not going to waste any of it. He's going to use it. And the best lesson that David ever learned is a lesson that each and every one of us should learn. 
which is we can trust in God. God was with David in the pasture when he had to go take out the lion and the bear to protect his flock. God was with David when he fought the giants. God was with David in the wilderness for eight years while he's running from Saul. David learned this lesson. I can trust God, and God is going to use that lesson to prepare David for the plans that God has for him as king. But what holds true for David holds true for us. God's going to use our life experience, the lessons we've learned for the future plans, and what we have to do is be faithful, and we've got to learn, God, I can trust you. And you can't learn to trust him unless you know him. Not know about him, but actually know him. David knew him. God was with him. So, enough about David before he was king. Today what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the day uh, that he actually became king and then how he began to set the trajectory of the kingdom that he would lead. You've probably heard the expression, oh, if I could be king for a day, wouldn't it be great to be king for a day? Your rules, your world, everybody else is just living in it, right? David, first day as king, not what you think. If you have your Bibles, uh, if you have your Bibles or your tablet, open them up. Uh, if you don't, hey, you can download this thing called U Version. Encourage you to download, uh, download the U Version app. It's a Bible, and you can follow along with us. Or we'd love to give you one, just because, man, this is the ultimate authority. It's God's love letter to us, and it's the authority on godly living, and we're going to use it. So here we go. First Samuel chapter thirty-one. We find out that Saul. And his son Jonathan are killed in a battle. And there's so many fun things I would love to talk to us about, but I don't have time to talk about that. But there's some neat things there. You should read about the account. So in 1 Samuel chapter 31, God brings Saul's kingdom. He brings his reign as king to an end. And uh, his son Jonathan, who was heir to the throne, dies in the same battle. And people who were present in that battle understand that now David is going to become king. And like anybody with the latest news, what do you want to do? You want to share that news with the right people and with the most excitement that you possibly can. So in 2 Samuel chapter 1, what we see is the people from the battlefield, they go to find David because they've got great news for this guy. He doesn't have to run anymore. He doesn't have to hide from Saul anymore. He's now going to be king. He gets to be the first one to say, David, you're king. And he goes and he recounts the story. But the response is anything but. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 1. This guy's just come, brought David the news. David and the guy stand around. David, you're going to be king, and I want you to see what happens. Then David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes, and they tore them. Now, this is not a Hulk Hogan, how you doing, brother? It wasn't that type of tearing your clothes, Okay. That was a pretty good Hulk Hogan voice, wasn't it? Yeah. I've been working on it all week. Hey, what, what do you do all week? I just work on my Hulk Hogan voice. No, that's not what I do. All right. Why did they do this? David just found out he's going to be king. And then what did they do? They mourned and they wept and they fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Isn't that odd? If you found out that you were going to be king, and they came and they told you you're going to be king, David and his men, you understand this. For the past 15 years, David's been waiting for this moment. For the past eight years, David has been hunted like a dog. He's had to flee the country. He's been in the wilderness. Like nobody would want this path to the throne. It has been awful for David. David's tried to, or Saul has tried to kill David and these men. And what do David and his men do? They mourn and they weep and they fast until dark. Why? Why do they respond that way? I would tell you they responded that way. Because God loved David so much. David loved God so much. And David had this relationship with God. And David loved God. And because David loved God and God loved David, David understood what people meant to God. He understood the value of human life. When he looked at the life of Saul, 
Here's this guy that God had chosen to be the first king of Israel, and he didn't finish good. And he mourned that. He mourned that because he knew that God mourned the fact that Saul didn't finish well. And David understood in order for him to be king, Saul needed to die. And David got the fact that somebody made in God's image, called by God, who didn't finish well, things weren't going to be well for them. And he just mourned. David feared and revered God so much that he valued life. Why are you telling us this? Because as followers of Jesus who understand God's love for us, and we're here today to declare our love for God, our love for God and God's love for us ought to change the way we view people. I don't know what you saw this week, but I saw a bunch of men who have behaved inappropriately And much like what happened when Saul passed away, there was a bunch of people on our TV coming to bring us the news of another man who was committed an unforgivable, I shouldn't say unforgivable, I should say unspeakable atrocity against a woman. And I'm not here to dive into that. It's inexcusable and it's unacceptable. But don't let your response to that be the same inexcusable or unacceptable unacceptable because what I have seen is not just people celebrating the bringing of justice but what I have seen is Christian and unchristian alike celebrate the undoing of a man made in the image of God far from God and his destruction has been celebrated how did David respond when a godless king's life came to an end. He mourned and he grieved and he wept and he fasted. Oh, that it would be said of a follower of Jesus Christ, when destruction befalls on somebody made in the image of God who is far from God and they fall, that our response would be different than the world. Rather than pile on, we would pray for. Rather than pile on, we would point to the only help and healing that these people could have possibly ever received, Jesus Christ. Because over the next few weeks, they're going to be told how unredeemable they are, how awful they are. Oh, that God would bring somebody along their paths to say, now, do I have your attention? There is a message. It is the greatest message ever given to humanity. It is the message of Jesus who has the power to save your soul through the forgiveness of your sins. I just think that if we, just like David, if we love God and we understand God's love for us, then we have to understand how much God loves the people sitting next to you, how much God loves the people who cut us off in traffic, God who loves the people who don't believe the same thing that we believe. Our faith, our trust in God has got to make a difference in how we live or we don't have it. But how David loved God and God loved David, David knew him and he understood, so he responded differently. Now, I could chase this rabbit for a little bit longer, but I'm going to try to move us along a little bit. But don't forget that. This week, when you're tempted to pile on, don't. Let God's love for you permeate your life and how you respond. So David is going to become king, and uh, he's going to become king not of all of Israel, He's actually only going to become king of Judah. So the tribe is going to be broken into two different kingdoms because, yes, Saul died, and yes, Jonathan died, but Saul's general, Abner, did not die, and the entire army was not defeated. So they fled back to Israel, and Saul has got an heir yet, and his name is Ishbosheth. I like to say Ishbosheth. However you want to say it, you can even do this. Ashibosheth, okay? I mean, however it helps you pronounce it, you just go for it. All to say, Saul's got an heir on the throne. His name is Ishbosheth, and, he, and, and Abner is going to prop him up as king. And I just want to show you what the kingdom's going to look like here for a minute. 
Here we go. You guys should be able to see it. So we've got like the northern, the northern kingdom of Israel, and we've got the southern kingdom of Judah. David is going to rule over Judah. Why? Because he's of the tribe of Judah. And he's going to set up his capital. He's going to rule. They're going to anoint him as king of Judah. And he's going to rule, you guys, right here. If you're colorblind, you might not be able to see. So I'm just going to go with different colors because I've got a lot of different options. It's awesome. Okay, cool, man. So that's where he's going to rule from. And he's going to be there seven and a half years. For seven and a half years, like God told him, you're going to be king, but you're going to be king over all of Israel. Well, he's just king of Judah right now, and he's not forcing the issue. I don't have time, but here's what I want to tell you. You guys should this week, it only take you 10 minutes to do it. Get into 2 Samuel chapter 2, where he's declared king, where he's anointed king over Judah, and read all the way through, because there is this plot that unhatches between 2 Samuel chapter 2 and chapter 5, where Ashibosheth's life is brought to an end. And we see around 2 Samuel chapter 5 that all of Israel then comes to Hebron and they say, okay, David, we know that this is God's plan. It is now time for you to be king over all of Israel. So now David's not just anointed king of Judah, he is now king over all of Israel. And David is a wise king, he is a godly king, because he's a godly king, he's a wise king. And he says, and he seeks the Lord. He's like, if I stay in Hebron, the people of Israel will never go with me because the house of Saul was up there. He's like, all these people will be too far from me. I need a more central capital. And so David, and go ahead, read along with me in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5. Let's look at this together. David and his army, starting in verse 6, the king and his men marched to Jerusalem. That's what it says in my Bible, and I don't know how it reads in yours, but it wasn't always known as Jerusalem. It was known as this city called Salem. And I think I've got a picture for it. Here it is. There it is. That's the ancient city of Salem. That's the ancient city of uh, David of Jerusalem. And so David and his men are going to come and they're going to attack the, uh, the um, Jebusites that live here. Now, interesting, at least to me, is David and his men are going to come to the city and they're going to stand somewhere over, over here, over in this area right here, which you know better in the New Testament is the Mount of Olives. So they come over there, and as David and his army shows up, dudes in this, uh, in this fortified wall, they start poking their heads up. They're like, hey, what's going on out here? What's going on? Well, let's read. So David uh, and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. But the Jebusites called from inside their own city. You will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off, they thought. David can't get in here. Have they not heard of David? Really? God has been using David to mow people down for God's glory. And they dare call this guy lame? Weak, blind, they're like, dude, we're not afraid of you. You'll never get in here. David's probably thinking, have they not heard of the God I serve? So David and his men over here on the Mount of Olives are looking at the best way into this city because this is going to be the new capital. I mean, this is obviously they're going to, this is going to be the new capital of Jer Jerusalem. And they come across this thing called the Gihon Springs. And you can see it right here. There was this spring, it was the water supply into the city. And they thought, you know what, I might not be able to penetrate those walls, but I can get in there. And so his, his, uh, his general, Joab, found the spring because they would try to camouflage that because they knew it would be a weak part of the city. Well, Joab found it. He goes back to David. He's like, David, I found the spring. And at the spring, I found a tunnel, and I think we can get through that tunnel. And if we can, like a Trojan horse, penetrate that tunnel, get in there, we can pop up on the inside of the city and take it. David's like, that's the plan. And if you read further along, you see that that's the plan. But I wanted to show you the tunnel that David and his mighty men went through. So let's quick check it out. Uh, let's just show a few seconds of this tunnel, not the whole clip. Hey, I'm taking you through that. So as you're watching this, imagine David and his army, they've been called lame and blind and told they're not going to get in here, and yet David and his men find their way into this tunnel, and they begin to make their way into the city, and they're going to take it over, and it's going to become the new capital. Now you understand, that video was really hard to get. That is a tiny tunnel for a really big guy to be in, man. 
But it's fun to imagine what it would be like, almost like this, because they didn't have lights in the tunnel like they're there. David and his men would have had torches, and they're on their way to conquering the city, and they conquered it. So that's how David became king of all of Israel. And as king of Israel, his job is to lead people in pursuit of God. That's where Saul failed. It's David's job to lead people in pursuit of God. And so now he's established his king in Jerusalem that he's going to be there for like almost 33 years. He's going to rule as king. It's going to be more like 32 and a half. But he's going to rule there for 32 and a half years. And uh, he becomes king at age 30. And his, that starts in Hebron. But he makes a calculated decision. He says, I want the Ark of the Covenant brought to Jerusalem. Now, the Ark of the Covenant for the Hebrew people, for the Israelite people, was a physical representation of the presence of God with them. If you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, after the, God had liberated them through Moses from, from Egypt, God instructed Moses to make a tabernacle and he gave them the, the blueprint for this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And it was a physical representation of God's presence with them. So any time and everywhere Israel went in their conquest of the promised land, what was always out front? The Ark of the Covenant because it was God leading them. And, and Israelites' armies didn't say, oh no, here comes Israel. They always said, oh no, here comes Israel's God and he's bringing Israel with him and it never turned out well for him. Well, God's saying, hey, or David's saying, we're going to bring God's presence to live among us, to be among us in the capital. And there's something really interesting that happened back in ancient times that we don't do here in America anymore. But what would happen is if you really valued something, you would build your life around it. Well, the most valuable thing, to the most valuable possession that David could ever have would be the presence of God with him. The most valuable possession that Israel could ever possess would be the presence of God with them. The most valuable thing, possession that we could ever have is a personal relationship with God because of Jesus. And David wanted the Israelites to remember this, so he brought in the Ark of the Covenant and he placed it in the middle of the city to say this is to be valued above all else. God. He is good. He's to be valued above all things. And as king, it was his job to lead. And here's what I would tell each and every one of us, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, a guardian, the responsibility falls to each and every one of us like it did to David that day. It is our job to share with our young people, to lead them in worship of God and not things of man. To illustrate and to show them that the most valuable possession they could ever own or ever possess is knowing God through his son Jesus. Well, David makes that declaration and we see just how good that declaration is. Because if you look in 2 Samuel chapter 6, it says uh, around verse 12, So David went down to the household uh, and brought up the ark of, ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David, Jerusalem, which he conquered. And when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and fattened calf. Like right out of the gates. He's like, God, this is about you. We're going to worship you. And there's a lot there. But David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might. Now, as David is leading people in their pursuit of God, he is doing so in his drawers. Why is he doing that? Because it's the presence of God is coming into the city. It's going to be the focal point. David remembers that God has taken him from a pasture and put him in a palace. David remembers that God was with him when he smote the giants. David remembers how God was with him in the wilderness and kept him from destruction. He remembers how God provided his need for clothing, his need for food, his need for companionship, his need for God's presence. In understanding all of that, David's only response to bringing and leading people in worship was to give God all of them. And man, his response was to dance in his skivvies. I love this quote by Francis Chan. Check this quote out. 
We're going to bring this thing to a close. I'll get there. Here it is. Isn't it good to worship a God we can't exaggerate? There is no possible way David could have ever exaggerated the goodness of God. Because God had been with David his entire life. And he had proven himself trustworthy. He had proven himself faithful. And David is like, you are so good, God. I don't just want to know you. I want your people to know your goodness. Because your goodness is too good to exaggerate. And if you looked at the people of Israel, if you looked at them as a nation, it would be impossible for them to exaggerate just how good God is. Because over and over and over again, he not only called them, but he protected them. He loved them. And he loves them still. Worship is any action taken in response to to glorifying God. For David, it was dancing and it was singing. But I would also say to us this morning, isn't it good to, isn't it good to worship a God that we can't exaggerate? Because if we're honest with ourselves, it would be impossible for us to exaggerate the goodness of God in our own lives. He has been with us from the very beginning, from our, from our mother's womb to this point. And while our lives were headed on a trajectory for eternal damnation, God, in his great love for us, sent his son Jesus and offers us life. And not just life, but life abundantly, life eternally. It is impossible to exaggerate a God that good. And as you reflect on your own life and how he's been, he's returned goodness, been so good to you, it'd be impossible for us to exaggerate that. And so we're going to close our service out this way. We're going to close our service out by singing, King of my heart. See, David was king of Israel. But he made God the king of his heart. And this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And we're going to sing this and put God on the throne of our heart and of our lives. Because he is good. And he'll never let us go. Now, a couple, couple rules about this. Nobody's going to dance in the aisles this morning. One, because we don't do that here. Two, we have guests and if we don't do that normally, we're not going to do that today because that would freak them out. What I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to worship your risen king. I'm asking you to worship God with your heart, your strength, your mind, and your soul. And just pour yourself out to him because his goodness is too good to be exaggerated. David, as a shepherd, as a warrior, and as a king, understood this fundamental truth. Life isn't about us. It's about bringing glory to the Father. Why? Because he loves us, and he is good, and the world is dying to know the goodness of God, and we are his hands and his feet to a dying, unbelieving world. And how will they know? How can they know unless we go and proclaim the goodness of God, which is great news for all people, for Jesus Christ came for us. Isn't he good? Let's go. Have a great week, everybody. Let's go love people like Jesus.